Mike Merritt has been at Texas A&M Forest Service since 1999. As regional community forester, Mike is involved in programs that demonstrate the value of utilizing trees as a tool for meeting the Houston's air and water quality requirements, as well as projects that demonstrate the healthy tree, healthy lives concept. For example, how trees improve human health and reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, respiratory problems, obesity, and improve learning and behavior in school. I think I'm going to plant more trees. Prior to his store service, um, Mike worked in residential tree care, worked as a vegetation management forester for HLMP, and actually owned his own consulting business focusing on work of NGOs. So please welcome Mike Merritt to provide an overview of trees and shrubs commonly found in southeast Texas and along the upper Gulf Coast. Good evening. I'm glad to be here. So what I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, I guess, common and uncommon trees for the upper Gulf Coast and southeast Texas. I've got about oh, 38 or 40 uh, that I'm going to present today, and they're by no means all of them. You know, we have, what, 100 and over 150 native trees and shrubs to, to this region. So there's no way I could cover all of them, but some of these are, most of these are really favorites of mine. So I will go over them. Why natives? That's kind of like I'm preaching to the choir here and I, I realize that, but you know, adaptability, native, native plants are way more adaptable to their surroundings that they're evolved with. They're more resistant to disease and pests and stress. Now that's native disease and pests. We're, we're getting a lot of uh, introduced and exotics coming in. And so our native species aren't really quite, you know, they can't handle those very well, like emerald ash borer is a possible threat in the coming years. And our ash trees are really gonna suffer a lot on that. But native trees are also, they, they live longer in the landscape. They have more longevity. And they generally will not dominate. Uh, you know, we can have discussions about some of our species that, that might be a little bit aggressive. Uh, we can call them invasive or not invasive, but some of them are kind of aggressive. But generally speaking, our native species will not dominate the landscape. Okay, so our first tree that I'm going to talk a little bit about is red maple. This is a medium to occasionally large deciduous tree with a narrow oblong crown in variable fall color. It can have yellows, reds, oranges. And in the spring, it's really, it's, it's really pretty. You can see right here, the red seeds. It has red flowers and red seeds. And the squirrels really love these seeds and, and the flowers as well. So it's, it's pretty good for wildlife. Its wetland designation is facultative meaning it can occur in wetland areas and non-wetland areas. But a little known fact that probably most of y'all did not know is our current state champ, red maple, is in the city of Houston. It's uh, 38 inches in diameter and 63 feet in height. So it's our current state champion. Uh, we have a runner up that's not quite as um, diameter wise, it's not as large, but it's 89 feet tall. So it, they can get on the proper site, they can get very, very tall. Okay, our next one is American Beauty Bear. This is a small shrub, deciduous shrub, up to about six feet in height with purplish fruit. It's usually found, it's usually found in somewhat drier areas in uh, our mixed pine hardwood stands. And it can form thickets in open areas, but will grow in the understory if it's not too dense. Uh, I have seen it many times in, in deep, deeper in the woods than I would expect it. Its wetland designation is facultative upland, meaning it usually occurs in upland areas, but may occur in some of the lower areas from time to time. 
Our next tree is pignut hickory. It's a deciduous, medium to large tree with a straight trunk and round crown. The bark has a grayish diamond pattern with the regular space branches in the foliage that turns yellow in the fall. Now, it's a con it has compound leaves, pinnately compound leaves. The other similar looking bark and leaves would be ash trees. They are pinnately compound and they have the grayish diamond pattern bark, but they are opposite leaves and opposite branching where pignut hickory is alternate. So that's one way to tell the difference. There are uh, down in Ormond Bayou Nature Center, there's a stand of pigment hickories that are really pretty nice. The largest one I measured down there is 25 inches in diameter and 95 feet tall. So if y'all are ever in Ormond Bayou Nature Center and uh, give me a call or shoot me an email and I'll give you the coordinates to some of these trees because they are really pretty. Our next tree is pecan. It's about the largest of the hickories. A pecan is a hickory. It has a uniform symmetrical and oval crown and it, it kind of has an upright spreading manner. It has large, oddly pinnately compound leaves and a large nut, relatively large nut. Uh, its bark is pretty distinctive. It's scaly, kind of with some ridging. It also, it's facultative upland. The wetland designation is facultative upland. And a lot of people confuse it with uh, bitter nut hickory. So in a low area, a true wetland, you won't see uh, a pecan down there, but you will see some bitter nut hickory because they look very similar. Okay, our next tree is sugarberry. And this is an excellent wildlife tree. It's a medium to sometimes large tree, has smooth gray bark with uh, corky warts, which we call lenticels. It has a round or vase-shaped irregular crown with yellowish greenish leaves. Sometimes the leaves are entire, meaning no serrations, but sometimes they are slightly serrated in the upper half. It's an excellent wildlife tree, like I said. It's host to a number of butterfly species and the fr fruit is eaten by quite a few birds and mammals. Uh, matter of fact, I have one in my yard. Uh, the wetland designation is facultative wetland, but it will grow in upland sites as well. Okay, Eastern Redbud, most, most everyone is familiar with this tree. It's a small, often multi-trunked tree with uh, kind of like a crooked trunk and a in kind of an irregular crown, irregular spreading crown. It has these pink to purplish flowers. In, in Texas, we have about three native species of redbud. We have the Eastern redbud, the Texas redbud, and the Mexican redbud. And they all grow in different zones in Texas, but they're all, the, the Mexican and the Texas are a little bit smaller than the Eastern redbud, but they're all very small and they're all really colorful in the, in the springtime. The, the legumes are flattened and they contain about six to 12 seeds that mature in summer, but are persistent into fall. And these are often used in our landscape settings. And its wetland designation is obligate upland. Next, we have fringe tree. And actually fringe tree is the tree on my, uh, that I'm using for my screenshot. It's a really beautiful tree. A lot of people are familiar with the Chinese French tree, which is being planted in landscapes now. It's a little bit more showy flowers that last a little bit longer, but American French tree is a really good tree. It's an understory tree, uh, sometimes multi-stemmed. It has a regular oblong crown, opposite branching. It's in the ash family, so it has opposite branching. It has these white attractive flowers and dark blue to black fruit and that matures late in the summer or fall. The wetland designation is facultative upland. Okay, hawthorn. I'm not gonna talk about any one particular hawthorn. It's hawthorn species, because there are so many of them. One time my goal in life was to become a hawthorn expert, but that didn't last too long because it was, <laughs> there's so many of them and so little differences in quite a few of them. 
But anyway, hawthorns are, are deciduous, large shrubs or small trees, usually occurring in the understory with white, attractive flowers in the spring. The fruits are pomes, but they come in various sizes depending on the species. And the twigs may or may not have thorns, depending on the species. The bark is usually kind of uh, flaky, but it can be orangish, it can be brownish, it can be reddish. All that is dependent on the species. And the wetland designation is either facultative or obligate wetland. It's an excellent wildlife tree. Oh, I meant to say um, our national champion, Little Hip Hawthorne, which is this leaf right here in flower is in Southern Montgomery County. And it's eight inches in diameter and 28 feet tall. And then we have a, a state and I believe national champion, Texas Hawthorne in Brazoria County in uh, Brazos Bend State Park. Persimmon. This is a small to medium sized tree that's found on a wide variety of sites. In the open, it has a round top crown of crooked branches, but is tall and straight in the forested areas. It's often found as a pioneer species coming in first before other tree species. You often get um, loblolly pine and uh, common persimmon coming in early. The bark is really distinctive. It has an alligator pattern. It has the large orangish at maturity fruits that are edible. If you eat them before they're ripe, they're pretty sour. Excellent wildlife tree, and the wood is highly desired for many uses, including, they used to make golf clubs with them, but furniture, a lot of different uh, uses for the wood. Believe it or not, there is one in Burroughs Park that is 90 feet tall. It's the tallest persimmon I've ever seen in my life, and it's really a unique tree. It's about 16 inches in diameter. The uh, wetland designation for persimmon is facultative. It can occur in wetlands and non-wetlands. Then we have a little understory shrub, Carolina buckthorn. It's deciduous. It can really take shade very well. It usually doesn't exceed 20 feet. It has this really glossy green foliage that's strongly veined. And then it has reddish berries turning dark blue or purple when mature. And that's wetland designation is facultative upland. It's really a pretty accent tree if you have room for it or a place for it. Green ash. This is a large deciduous tree with opposite compound leaves. Remember, opposite compound. Uh, hickory is alternate compound. And it has gray bark with shallow furrows and ridges and kind of a diamond pattern similar to mockernut and pignut hickory. The leaves turn yellow in the fall and it's usually found in bottomlands and often the trunk is swollen at the base in, in some of the wetter areas. Uh, it, is, it is prone to emerald ash borer so if we do get emerald ash borer down here we're going to have a big problem with uh, our green ash populations. One way to tell the difference between green ash and white ash is that uh, green ash is, is facultative wetland, but it will grow on upland sites as well. A white ash will hardly ever, if ever, grow on a low wet site. I, I don't believe I've ever seen a white ash on a low wet site. Uh, also, the buds on green ash, the lateral buds, tend to sit at the, the top of the leaf scar where on white ash, they'll sit down in the notch. So those are basically two ways that you can tell the difference between a green ash and a white ash. Possum Hall, it's a small deciduous tree or a large shrub, usually multi-stemmed. It's found in the understory. It has these real attractive orange red persistent fruits on the female trees. So the trees are dioecious, meaning uh, separate sexes on different plants. It's an excellent wildlife species, good accent species. This is another one I have planted in my yard. And during the winter when the leaves fall off, it's really beautiful seeing just all these red berries on it. It's a faculty of wetland species, but it does grow on some upland sites from time to time. Eastern red cedar. It's a 
pretty unique looking, I think. I actually, this is, I have a lot, I have over 40 trees in my yard and most of them are different species. So this is another one I have, I have planted, but it's to me very unique looking. It's a medium to large evergreen conifer with a really straight trunk and a pyramidal crown. The bark is usually reddish brown and it shreds. Uh, excellent wildlife tree, the birds really feed on, some bird species really feed on berries, provides excellent nesting and cover. It's a really good species. And I, I've seen it grow up to 80 feet before. The wetland designation is facultative upland. Wax myrtle, this is one of our evergreen multi-stem shrubs, or it could be a small tree from time to time. It's usually found in open sites, forest edges or fence rows. Uh, it may occur in brackish areas as well. And it can become quite aggressive. This is one of our species that can kind of take over a site left uh, on its own devices. So if, if you do have a site and that's fairly open, you need to maintain it to keep it from, from taking over. Uh, but the seed is utilized by a lot of different bird species. It has this white grayish coating over the seed, waxy coating over the seed, but it does provide nesting areas and cover for wildlife. Its wetland designation is facultative, so it does occur both in wetland and non-wetland sites. Red mm -hmm. mulberry, this is one of my favorites. Fruit trees, it's a small to medium deciduous, it's often found in understory with a broad spreading crown and large heart-shaped leaves that may or may not be lobed uh, with serrated margins. The fruit is edible, looks like a, a blackberry. It's an excellent wildlife tree. The fruit is eaten by many bird species and mammals like raccoons, possums, and squirrels. It's a designation, wetland designation is facultative upland but I have seen it in some fairly low areas. One way to tell the difference between white mulberry and red mulberry, I think they're often confused, but if you take a look at the site, white mulberry is somewhat shade intolerant. So I'm not saying it will never be found in the understory, but it doesn't do as well in shade, whereas red mulberry can handle shade. So if it's an open area and you see a lot of mulberries out there sprouting in an open area, they're usually going to be white mulberries. Another way to tell the difference, to me at least, is the bark and the twig color. It seems to be a little bit lighter tinted or more orangish. That, that's what I've noticed. So if you have a, a really light colored bark or twig and a tree in the open, there are good chances it could be a red mulberry. Black gum, this is a large deciduous tree with a straight trunk. And again, this is another one that in wet areas may develop a, a swell. One of the unique things about this tree is it, its branching pattern is at 90 degrees. So if you look at these limbs coming out of this tree, they're almost all right about at 90 degrees. And you can really, it, it's really noticeable once you start looking for it. So you can be driving down the road and if you see a tree with 90 degree branching patterns, then chances are you have a black gum. It has a real variable bark. It can be kind of blocky or corky, or it can be kind of uh, flaky as well. So it, it's, it's a real distinctive tree. It has these nice uh, blueberries that are eaten by turkey, by quail, uh, by squirrels, by birds, a lot of different species, by wood ducks. It's also well known for its honey source. Tupelo honey is made from black gums. Its uh, wetland designation is facultative. Loblolly pine. This is, a, of course, an evergreen conifer. It's a fast growing pine, which can it reaches in excess of 100 feet on the proper site. It's usually kind of pyramidal when young but it loses its lower limbs as it matures, as it gains age, and it, it develops more of a rounded crown when mature. And there's usually three needles per fascicle uh, between four, three to six inches long, four to six inches long. Sometimes there's two. Uh, the, the tree in the center here is the largest pine that we know of, Loblaw 
loblolly that we know of in Harris County. And it's uh, second place when it comes to our state champion trees, but it's 59 inches in diameter and 107 feet tall in the south northwest Harris County. American sycamore. This is another excellent landscape tree. It gets very large. It has heavy spreading branches and zigzag twigs. But again, on the proper site, it's capable of, of reaching an excess of 100 feet. Matter of fact, we have one on the Greens Bayou Mitigation Bank that's over 100 feet tall. I, I believe it's a, between 102 and 105 feet tall. Excellent tree. Uh, American sycamores are readily identifiable by its mottled bark and whitish smooth trunk. And if you notice some really white trunks, you might be looking at a uh, Mexican sycamore. Those are planted pretty commonly here in the Houston region. And they look really similar to American sycamore. Uh, their bark or their trunk is to me a lot more whitish and the underside of the leaves are very hairy and very white. So that's two of the differences in, uh, between American sycamore and Mexican sycamore. The Mexican plum. This is a very attractive landscape tree. I have one plant in my yard as well. It's uh, usually single trunk, it's deciduous. It grows to about 15 feet in height, sometimes 20. Although we have a couple in Harris County that are in excess of, of 23 feet up to about 25 feet. Has a spreading crown with these white showy flowers blooming in early spring. And it has edible plums that ripen in midsummer to late summer. If you can see my pointer, this tree right here is at a church in the Heights. And it used to be the state champion Mexican plum, but it's since been dethroned. It's, I, I couldn't really find a wetland designation in any of my sources. Uh, but I'm thinking it's probably facultative because the habitat description describes it as dry to moist open woods, river bottoms, prairies, and thickets. So you usually don't see it a lot in wet areas, but every once in a while. But I, I think it would be either facultative or facultative upland. Black cherry. This is one of my all-time favorites. It's got, to me, really beautiful bark that flaky bark when it gets older. This is one I used to have in my yard and it died during the 2011 drought. I guess I just didn't get enough water to it. But it's a deciduous medium-sized tree with a long straight bowl, usually. Uh, sometimes you see them where they're kind of crooked and somewhat flaky bark. It has clusters of white flowers in spring that develop after the leaves come out. And then it has these clusters of black fruit when ripe. Now, at least the tree that I had in my yard, the birds really didn't let it get ripe because, I mean, they came in and they would just tear the fruit up. They ate it all before it really got really dark color. It'd be kind of like the medium purplish color, but they would just eat it as fast as they could. It's a facultative upland, usually occurring in upland areas. Then we have overcup oak. I really like this oak. It's a deciduous, large tree. You normally find it in forested wetlands. It has crooked and drooping branches that form in an open, irregular crown. But it's often planted in landscape settings because it does well in poor soils. Trees grow that grow in, um, in wetland areas will generally do good in our urban soils if you, you, know, you take care of them and give them the appropriate amount of water but they're used to growing in poor, low oxygenated soils. The overcup also has a very distinctive acorn with a cap that covers almost the entire nut. So it's a really interesting, neat tree. And it's an obligate wetland. Then we have burrow. This is a large deciduous tree with a short body and heavy branches that form an open spreading crown. The acorn is very large and it is closed in a deep cup that covers about half of the nut with the fringes at the bottom of the, of the cup. It's utilized by a lot of wildlife species for its fruit, it has that large acorn. I call it a, a Halloween tree because when it's younger and during the winter when all the leaves are off, it just looks kind of really spooky. 
But once it gets older and matures and it kind of fills out, it doesn't look quite as spooky, but my neighbor has one across the street and it's probably about 15 feet tall and three inches in diameter. And during the winter, it's a real spooky looking tree. Um, now a friend of mine makes acorn flour out of bur oak. He'll co collect his bur oak and go through the process and get all the tannins out and grind it up. And I think he uses like about a quarter of a cup of acorn flour to three quarters of a cup of wheat flour. And it, it makes a, an interesting cookie in brownie. It's kind of heavy, kind of dense, and it has kind of an earthy taste, but it's, it's really not bad. So it's, it's something that, that can be done. And I'm sure the Native Americans used it a lot. Swamp chestnut oak, another tree I have planted in my yard. Actually, this photo right here is, is my tree. It's a deciduous tree, large with flaky or, or platy bark. It has a large unlobed leaf with coarsely serrated margins and a large acorn that is one of the preferred sources of deer in the fall. Uh, white oak, the swamp chestnut is in the white oak group and white oaks gen generally have a sweeter tasting acorn to wildlife and swamp chestnut and white oak are just really excellent food sources for, for deer and, and for turkey. Another common name, two other common names for uh, swamp chestnut oak are basket oak and cow oak. Y'all might have heard uh, swamp chestnut being called by those names before. Its wetland designation is in the western Gulf Coast region. It's facultive, but in the Atlantic and the eastern Gulf Coast regions, it's, it's more of a facultive wetland species. And then cherry bark oak. This is one of my all-time favorite trees. It has that long straight trunk. It's just um, a really, really stately tree to me. People ask me, you know, what my favorite tree is. And it's, it's always different depending on what day it is, what time of day it is, what I ate for breakfast, things like that. But when I think about it, a cherry bark oak is just really your classic oak. And it's, uh, it's, it's one of the trees that impresses me the most. But anyway, it's a large oak of the bottomlands with a tall straight trunk capable of reaching in excess of 100 feet in height. Uh, in Angelina County, we've measured one that was 124 feet tall. And I've seen some out there in Angelina that 60, 70 feet before the first branch. So it's a really nice tree, scaly or flaky cherry-like bark at maturity. And it's a good mass provider for squirrels and for deer. This wetland designation is facultive wetland. So it's usually found in the wetter sites. Sumard oak, this is one that's preferred in, in landscape settings as well. It's a real pretty trees, has really good architecture, has a wide spreading symmetrical crown. It often occurs either in singles or in very small groups in forest stands. I don't think I've ever seen it dominate the canopy as far as numbers go. You know, you walk into a, a forest and you might see a lot of willow oak or you might see a lot of water oak or even cherry bark oak in, in, in some of those areas, but you rarely see a lot of shumards where, the, you, you know, within their range, you'll see them here and there, but you, you don't see very many at all. The leaves turn scarlet in the fall, a nice scarlet color. This wetland designation is facultive, so it occurs in, in lower areas and non-wetland areas as well. And then post oak, I, I love this tree. It's just, it just has a hard existence. It's a medium to large tree with a short trunk and a compact rounded crown. The, the leaves have three to five lobes with the lobes being rounded, typical of oaks in the white oak, white oak group, they have rounded, rounded lobes where the oaks in the red oak group have more pointed lobes. Uh, the, the upper lateral lobes on the post oak form kind of like a cross with the terminal lobe, but they're usually intolerable of site change or construction damage, things like that. So we're seeing a lot of post oak mortality throughout the state actually. 
and there are various reasons for that. But here in Harris County, I think a lot of the post oak mortality that we're seeing is due to flooding because they're an obligate upland. A true post oak is obligate upland. And so it really doesn't take water that well. And you go to places like Bear Creek, which are full of post oak, and they are all stressing. They are all starting to kind of go down, to spiral down. They're just not looking good. And if you look at the past decade, uh, we've had a lot of flooding out in Bear Creek. You know, it's uh, Army Corps of Engineers. It's, uh, it's a reservoir. It's doing its job out there, but it's really the, it's impacting the post oaks that are out there in the park. So I, I think, you know, we tend to see them in, in some wet areas, but I, I just don't think it was that wet when they were, when they uh, germinated and became established. Then wing sumac. This is a really pretty tree in the fall. Uh, it's a deciduous, uh, thicket forming small tree or shrub with irregular branching pattern and foliage that will turn a brilliant scarlet in the fall. It has real conspicuous limicils on the bark and it has clusters of red droop fruit that mature in the fall and are persistent throughout the winter. So this makes it a real good wildlife tree for a bird species because the fruit is persistent through a lot of the winter. It's obligate upland, but I have rarely seen it in some lower areas. Our state champion wing sumac is in Harris County, right off of Hardy Toll Road, north of 1960. And it's six and a half inches in diameter and 35 feet tall. So if you are familiar with sumacs, a sumac that big is humongous. It's really big. Wild cypress. Most everyone is familiar with bald cypress. It's a deciduous conifer. It has a large tree with a tall straight trunk. It's often swollen or fluted, fluted at the base again in more of the wetter areas. It has conical shaped uh, or rounded cypress knees. Bald cypress is pyramidal when young, but it develops a broad open flat top when it's mature. Again, it's another species that's often used as a landscape tree because of its tolerance of poor soils and urban areas. Uh, and it's really a lot more drought tolerant than most people realize. Once it becomes established, it's, it's pretty well drought tolerant. It might lose its, its needles uh, late in the summer during a drought, but it will generally come back. It's an excellent wildlife tree. Cavities are used by wildlife for nesting and denning and the seeds are eaten by a variety of uh, birds. And obviously it's wetland designation is obligate wetland, even though it does grow when planted in more well-drained sites. Carolina basswood, this is another tree I have planted in my yard. It's a, it can be a large, medium to large deciduous tree with a tall straight trunk, but it often sprouts at the base so you might think of it as being multi-trunked at times because the main trunk might have died and all the, the sprouts at the base might have started really growing. So sometimes you see it multi-stemmed and sometimes you see it with not so quite a, a straight trunk either. But it's really, a, I think, a really neat tree. It forms a dense oval or rounded crown and it usually occurs in mid to top slopes ravines, creeks, bayous, and sandy or silty loam soils. It's an excellent source of honey and the nuts are eaten by squirrels as well as some uh, bird species. It has a leaf that looks like uh, red maple. A lot of people confuse it with red maple. One difference is the leaf of uh, basswood is asymmetrical, meaning it's uneven at the base where red maples are usually more even. The inner bark of this tree was used by Native Americans and early settlers to make rope or, or twine. So this tree is a facultative upland tree. It's one that I've, even though it grows kind of in riparian areas, I've never seen it in a truly lowland or wet site. It's always in well-drained areas. Winged Owl, this is a very underutilized tree in my opinion. It's, it's a really neat tree. It's a medium to large tree with a tall, straight trunk and a somewhat open vase-like crown. The twigs have the quirky wing-like growth on it that gives it the name of winged elm. 
the state champion tree, which is in the middle, this is our state champion tree. It's in Harris County. It's on the Spring Creek Greenway Trail, and it's 34 inches in diameter and 95 feet tall. We have another one in Harris County that's 102 feet tall, but it doesn't quite have the diameter of this tree. So they can get very large. Then we have American Elm. These trees can also get large. They also have a tall straight trunk that can be somewhat buttressed in wet areas. Uh, upright branches that form a vase-like spreading crown. The bark is really variable but usually flaky or scaly at maturity. The leaves again have an asymmetrical base. All elms pretty much have an asymmetrical base. And this tree, this species has doubly serrated margins and the seeds are very deeply notched at the tips. So there's a deep notch right here at the tip. It's wetland designation is facultative so it can grow in both wetland and non-wetland areas. Then we have cedar elm real attractive tree. It's commonly used in landscape settings. Uh, sometimes I think we should use this less and wing down more, but it's a medium to large tree with a tall straight trunk, stiff kind of shorter branches that form a narrow oblong crown. Uh, Textile often uses it in its uh, roadside plantings because it doesn't get a large crown. Uh, it often, like winged elm, has the corky wings on the twigs. So people a lot of times confuse it with winged elm. But this is uh, the one elm, the one native elm rather, that, that fruits in the fall. So if you're having trouble distinguishing between a cedar elm and a winged elm, if it's fruiting in the, in the spring, it's a winged elm. If it's fruiting in the fall, it's a cedar elm. It's a larval host for a number of butterflies and its wetland designation is facultative. So it occurs both in wetlands and non wetlands. Then sparkleberry, this is a really uh, small tree, a beautiful tree. Uh, another one that I think is underutilized in some of our landscape settings. It is an understory tree, so it doesn't do well in full sun, but it's a, if you have a shady place, then by all means plant it. I think it's a, a great tree, it has these beautiful bell-shaped white flowers in the spring. And then it, it has this really dark purple, blue, black fruit in the fall. And the foliage is, is, has a small elliptical leaf with the kind of glossy foliage and it does really well. And that's facultive upland as well. Then we have Southern Arrowwood. It's a, another small multi-stem deciduous shrub. The leaves have really coarse dentate tooths on them. Uh, the flowers are kind of like a flat top cluster of small white flowers. And then the berries that form are also in a cluster of deep blue berry. It, it grows better in full sunlight or light shade. It doesn't do that good in a dense understory, but it's kind of like uh, American beauty berry. You know, from time to time, you see it in the understory where you wouldn't expect it but it is a, a really neat tree, it's a viburnum, so it's opposite branching, opposite leaves, and it's a good tree to add to the landscape. And then lastly, we have rusty black hole. Uh, this is another smallish understory tree with glossy green foliage and these white cluster of, of flowers that come out after the leaves form, but they just last for a pretty good while and it's just really a, a pretty flowering tree. Then it has the, the berries that turn a deep color purple or blue. Uh, the leaves will turn red in the fall. And the bark is real distinctive. It has this real corky bark. And when we were in, um, in forestry school in Dendro, and we had this out in the lab as a test tree, we would go up and kick the bark. And if it went into like an orangish powder or a rusty colored powder, then we knew it was a rusty black hawk. So um, it's another good tree that you see it from time to time, but I would like to see it planted a lot more. Do we have time for questions? Yeah, Mike, we have tons of questions. What is the difference between a red maple and a drum and red maple? Not really anything. I mean, there are some differences, but it's just a different genetic variety. Drum and red maple is Acer rubrum variety drum and I think drum and die. 
and uh, red maple is acerubrum variety rubrum. I could be wrong. Uh, I'm not really in the landscape business, but is the Drummond red maple the one that is more of a, a, of a swamp species? I, I think, or, or it could be the other way around. There's a little bit of variability in the leaves, but in generally there's, I mean, generally there's not that much difference, at least to me that I've seen in growth patterns. Yeah, okay, the next one is Drummond likes wetter areas. Okay. Where is the red maple champ located? That's in uh, River Oaks. I forgot when it was planted. It, it really, it's a relatively young tree as far as trees go. I believe it was planted in the late 60s or early 70s. And so, but it's gotten a lot of care and it's just a, a beautiful tree. Uh, it's on private property. So I really hesitate to give the exact location of it. You can go to the Houston area urban forestry website and go to Big Tree Registry, Harris County Big Tree Registry. And I think it's listed in there with the block number. So you can do that. How do you identify pecan versus walnut trees if the nut of each is not fruiting yet? Well, really the only, uh, I, I guess my question to you is, are you meaning true walnuts or hickories? Uh, because walnuts, the only real walnut, native walnut we have here is a black walnut. And the, and the leaves are a lot different, a lot more leaflets on the black walnut. The leaflets are shaped differently. Uh, the bark is different. The bark is a really darker colored bark with a lot of deep fissures in it. Um, and it's, it's real, a really easy distinction to make on, on that one. Uh, now on the on the hickories like the pig nut and the mocker nut, again the, the fruits pretty identifiable, but the leaves are also very identifiable too because the the, the leaves of the uh, in the leaflets of the wal walnut I mean of the pig nut and mocker nut are generally larger, and the bark is tighter or more diamond shaped. You have more ridges. Uh, you don't have the scaly or flaky type of bark that you have on the uh, on the pecan and the uh, water hickory. How do you identify sugarberry from hackberry and net leaf hackberry? That can be pretty tricky, uh, really can. Uh, one of the ways is look at a range map and see where hackberries are native and the sites that they grow on as opposed to sugarberry and net leaf hackberry. You get out in the, in the hill country and sometimes it's really hard for the most part, our hackberries down here are really sugarberries. A true native hackberry, its range doesn't come down to the Houston area. I, I believe it uh, stops in somewhere in North and Northeast Texas. But now there probably are a lot of hackberries that are planted. And this isn't a foolproof way, but generally speaking, the leaves on the, on the true hackberry the, the margins are toothed or, or serrated. The, the entire margin of the, of the leaf is serrated, whereas on sugarberries, they're, they're not. They're, um, they're either half, the upper half is toothed or they're, they're smooth or what we call entire margin. So that's, that's one way to distinguish prune hackberries and sugarberries. As far as net leaf hackberry, that, that can be really difficult and I spent three years out in West Texas and it was still hard for me. So I, I have to have a key with me to be able to, to tell the difference between those. Um, so I don't think I can give you a really good explanation right now. Are wax myrtles dioecious? Yes, they are, they are. Are redbud trees that are along Clear Creek, Texas redbud or Mexican redbud? If they're native, they are Eastern red bud. If they're planted, I can't tell you because I haven't seen those particular trees. Why are Mexican sycamore planted more often than the American? Namely, because American uh, sycamore is prone to anthracnose. Mexican sycamore, it gets anthracnose, but it's not as susceptible to it. And also Mexican sycamore grows on 
poorer sites. I mean, it grows in Mexico in areas that are a little bit harsher than they are here in Houston. Again, the American sycamore is originally, you know, natively, I guess, more of a riparian species. And so it, it likes those rich soils. In our urban settings, we don't really have that. So Mexican sycamore is more drought tolerant and it's less susceptible to, um, to anthracnose and it does a little bit better in poor soils. Do you have any suggestions regarding mixes of trees in a forest as far as sustaining bird life? Armand Bayou has large patches that are near monocultures of yopon, oak, and sweet gum. Well, anytime you have diversity, I mean, you obviously you know this, uh, you're going to have more and better wildlife. As far as any suggestions on mixes of trees, well, it really depends on the site. Is it a wet site? Is it an upland site? Uh, is it a shady site? I mean, I, I, I know when we get a, a monoculture of, uh, of yopon or, you know, cherry laurel for that matter, it can get really dense in there. So the main thing is just to go in and if you can, if it's feasible for, the, for you or the organization to do some thinning. I mean, we want these yellow pond stands, we want these terror laurel stands, but we also want a, a more diverse thing that provides more habitat for all the different types of wildlife. So I, I would have to look at a specific site, the size of the site, what it looks like as far as is a wetland area, upland area, the drainage, the soil types before I would go in with, I could give a really good mix on, on what species of trees should go in there. Why is bald cypress called bald? Because it loses its leaves during the winter, it's deciduous. Are these trees commercially available? Some of the trees are like winged elm. I wish that was more commercially available, but you just rarely find it. So some of the trees are, some are. How do you distinguish between almus rubra and the other two elms you described during the summer. That's pretty hard. It's extremely hard. One way is the inner bark, which you, then you have to cut into the bark. And if this has this kind of mucus feeling to it, or it's really slick, then that's uh, almost rubra. The seeds are a little bit different. Uh, the leaves are, are real similar, and the bark is real similar. So it's it's really difficult to make that distinction. And again, that's another species where you want to have a key with you when you're look, trying to figure out which one of the species is it. Have you seen any post oak acorns in the past two years? Very few. Yeah, I'm personally, I'm pretty worried about our post oaks. I mean, we have a ton of them throughout the state and we have, we still have a lot here in Houston, but we're just not having a lot of regeneration of post oaks. And I think, you know, all oaks, and pretty much all trees, I, I guess, are kind of cyclical when it comes to fruiting. Some years they, they really produce and some years they don't. But it seems like post oak for the last couple of years, their seed production has been lacking. You expected to hear about live oak and water oaks. These are natives, right? Yeah, you know, I thought about live oak, but everybody knows what a live oak is. They're, they're planted here, you know, way, I guess, way over planted. So I was just, I, I know I hit some pretty commonly planted trees, but I also tried to get some trees that weren't quite as common. Uh, so that, that's why I didn't include species like live oak and water oaks in, in the listing. Hey, Mickey. Yeah. Um, it's Wendy, sorry, Debbie unmuted me. <laughs> <laughs> so I've also heard that the live oaks actually are not really even native to the Clear Lake area, that they were just all planted here. Is that true? Most of them. Most of them were, but live oaks, from what I've read, and if, if you do a search, and I, I don't know if Andy has seen this or not, but Dr. Kim Coder out of the University of Georgia has an excellent paper on live oaks. And according to him, live oaks are pretty much the, the true uh, coastal live oak, Quercus virginiana, not the escarpment live oak, uh, but Quercus virginiana is uh, probably, he says it has a 50 mile range from the, from the coast. 
So that would put Clear Lake right in that range. But I also think it has to do with uh, some soil types and things like that. So, I mean, if you look back, you know, Clear Lake was mainly prairie down there. So you might have had some some live oaks along some of the riparian corridors, like maybe uh, Clear Lake. I mean Clear Creek and and uh, maybe Armand Bayou, things like that. But in general, well, I, I mean, let's take a look at um, San Jacinto, the Battle of San Jacinto. There were live oaks there, so yeah, live oaks are are native to that area. Thank okay, you. just not to the degree that they're planted everywhere. They're just Correct. everywhere. Correct. <laughs> question was it wasn't actually a question I think when you were talking about the basswood tree you meant to say red that the leaf looks like a red bud instead of a red maple oh no I meant to say a red mulberry red mulberry okay okay I, I'm sorry that makes sense okay. if I said two... red bud or red maple then yeah I I, I misspoke uh, so a basswood leaf look, looks like a red mulberry leaf an unlobed red mulberry leaf Yes, we have both of those species in a project we're doing at the university, and we're having a heck of a time telling them apart. So, yeah, I agree with that. And and it's an um, asymmetrical base. So if it has an asymmetrical base, then it's more than likely a basswood. I, I like this comment. Regarding the question of forest species mixes, suggest you consider layering diversity of heights, canopy, mid-level, understory, trees and shrubs, subshrubs. For diversity of the forest for life. Yeah, that's true. That's a much better answer than I gave. Do you have understory recommendations for windy parts, sunshade site? I don't know if I have any for for windy, but for um, sunshade sites, I mean, most of the of the of the shrubs that I went over are the small trees, the understory trees. I mean, obviously they'll do well in shaded areas. For the sunny sunny sites, I mean things like uh, wax myrtle, American beautyberry, even um, arrowwood, rusty black hall will will do well in a in a sunny site. So you, you know many of these species will do well in in sunny sites. Where can we buy native trees? There's quite a few nurseries. We're not supposed to recommend any one uh, business or company or or nursery. I would say do your uh, due diligence, just take a look, look at their websites and see what they have. How can you tell if the loblolly pine is doing poorly? Uh, you'll start seeing a lot of dieback in the tips. Now, in the interior of the crown, it's common for loblolly to have dead limbs in the interior of the crown. So I wouldn't worry too much about that unless it's just a, obviously a lot of dead wood. But if you start to get branch dieback from the tip or crown dieback, or the, the foliage starts turning more of a, a yellowish green or a lime colored green, then I would start looking at what to do because uh, then you might have a problem. My young Mexican plums leaves often look stressed or wilty. Are there common problems or treatments? You know, Mexican plums, they, to me, they often do look stressed. Uh, their leaves are just, in the fall, I mean, in the spring when they first come out, they look great, but once summer hits, they just, the leaves just start looking terrible. I mean, mine, mine does as well. So, but it, it grows, it's, my tree is a really healthy tree. Uh, just midsummer to late summer, it starts looking really, the leaves just don't look good, but it has good growth. So I, without seeing, seeing the tree or seeing a picture of it, it, I really can't comment, but it's not unusual for Mexican plums to, plums to kind of look not very well during the summer. Thank you.